I have been born with our parents. I was sold into the brother. I was forced to have sex. And I was raped. Who is Somali mom depends who you ask. Somali is one of the most incredible people I have met. The stories that she told for the media got lots of attention because they were so horrific. She spoke on the Tyra Banks show and the Oprah show. They put me in the cage. They put snakes in the cage? Yes. And the TV shop. About how old were you, do you think? I was around maybe 10 or 12 years old. What if we told you her story wasn't true? that there are so many cracks in it, she's resigned from her US-based charity. When Somali Mom's story began to unravel, suddenly there was a whole heap of attention on this industry, these orphanages that had been fabricating or at least exaggerating stories in order to raise money. <laughs> The word orphan and orphanage had been bastardized. The concept of orphanages has long been considered outdated in developed countries, and yet these institutions still house hundreds of thousands of children in the developing world. Every day at the orphanage, it's like you are in a monster house. My father, he loved reading newspaper, reading poem, and when I was very young, he always carried me to a pagoda, like very rare event. They will put a big white screen very late at night, and like putting some very, very good movie, very old movie from the Golden Age. I always like fell asleep before it's finished. So always my father carrying me back home while I'm asleep. After my father died, my mother, she is alone and there is not a lot of job for her to do. I was nine years old when I first entered the orphanage. There is a guy, a monk, and he talked to my mother saying his place can take care of us. I remember the day that I went to the orphanage. They show me the place to sleep, the kitchen, give us some good clothes and new shoes. I was very happy. And every day there is a lot of um, foreigner, donor, sponsor come to the orphanage. One volunteer, Tara Winkler, she keep coming. wanted to have a gap year so I decided to take some time out and travel through Southeast Asia and I think like a lot of Westerners I felt quite uncomfortable being on holiday surrounded by so much poverty and wanted to do something to give back while I was there and um, my tuk-tuk driver suggested that I go to the market and we can buy some secondhand clothes and books and toys and then I could go and hand those out at the local orphanages and one of the orphanages I visited was particularly poor. That's where I met Sinet, but I had never seen poverty like I saw in that orphanage. They were drinking dirty water, they were eating scraps from the monastery down the road. There were kids there with really serious health conditions. At that time, I was just so naive. I just bought into the story that going to an orphanage and visiting kids and volunteering is a great thing to do and makes you a good person.
I'm Matt Blomberg. I'm a correspondent for the Thomson Reuters Foundation in Cambodia. I focus on human trafficking, modern slavery. The unravelling of the Cambodian orphanage industry as it had become really began with the Somali mom story. So I have been born without parents. I was in the street and then after I had been sold in the brothel. I try to help all the girls, all the women who was like myself before. Somali mom, who is a hero every single day in helping women and girls who have been abused to try to get their lives back. Hey, ladies on the right together, right here. All the way to the right. Before too long, she was rubbing shoulders with the elite, telling these stories in order to garner attention and donations. She had Hillary Clinton come and visit her center, and she had Meg Ryan come and visit. Cheryl Sandberg, the Facebook boss, was on the board. So you've saved over 5,000. More than 7,000. More than 7,000. Seven seven we have also in Vietnam and Laos. She quickly became one of the global faces of this fight against human trafficking and, and trafficking of women in particular. Honor Disclaimer Magazine's Woman of the Year, a CNN hero, and most recently named as one of Time Magazine's most influential people of the year. She was beautiful and strong and a great character for the media. I mean, loads of media got carried away with it. The ultimate mother and freedom fighter, Somali mom. For two decades, Cambodia's Somali mom has been the face of the country's anti-sex trafficking campaign. But following reports that she lied about her past, she's been called a fraud and her foundation shut down. As well as being accused of fabricating her own story, Somali Mom has been accused of coaching victims in Afasip's care to fabricate their stories to attract attention and ultimately more funding. When the Somali Mom story broke, firstly here, it really lifted the lid on something that a lot of us who lived here knew had been going on for a long time, that children were being used as props to raise donations. But it wasn't until Newsweek published the full expose that it kind of truly went global. Suddenly there was a, a whole heap of attention on this, this industry, these orphanages and these shelters where girls and women end up after they're rescued from these situations. Somali was, was the first big target and she was a really easy target because she had become such a shining star, but she was far from the only one. the orphanage, they are very strict. Every day we need to wake up at four, cleaning the orphanage area and the pagoda, prepare food for the monk. And if I sleep late, there will be a, a bucket of water throw onto my face. And sometimes if we don't do what they want, they will um, like hit us. I realize that I don't have somebody like my father going to protect me, like when I was uh, young. When I was raped by the director of the orphanage, It's, it was so tragic for me and I was so, so scared and I feel like I live in a horrifying, like tight, very tight place that I can't go anywhere. I always hiding myself to get away from the director. Sometimes I wear a lot of pants, thought that should be protect me, but it's not. Every day at the orphanage is it's like you are in a monster house. We sleep 
on a long dormitory, row by row, with the mosquito net. Sometimes he just stand in front of where I sleep and pull the mosquito net just to look at me. And I know he's standing there, but I, I pretend to sleep. was about six months into living in Cambodia and my Khmer was pretty fluent and I could communicate properly with the kids at this stage and um, I remember sitting around talking with one of them actually one of the kids um, was getting in trouble for stealing and sending money back home to his mum and that was the first time I learned that he had a mum <laughs> and you know these were kids that I had thought had nobody in the world to love and care for them. This one boy had living parents and quickly found out that all of the children had living relatives. ตะกะตานี่ได้ทําไม้โพ้ my initial reaction was a sort of judgment to these parents like what kind of parents give their children up to an orphanage and it was on that trip and meeting these kids' parents for the first time and seeing how much they love their kids and how much they miss them, that, yeah, I realised how wrong those judgments were. They believed that it was a path out of poverty to a better life. And trusting their children into the orphanage was, in many ways, an act of love. <laughs> This orphanage has been around almost 20 years. We call a new hope for orphan. The word hope, I pick up scripture from the Bible, a living hope for those who believe in Jesus. We have around 500 children, around 16 homes around the country. These children, when we pick them up, start from like one month old up to like 
12 years old. But now some of them, they are pro already and they study in different school. We have a policy in our organization. We focus those who are real often. That means the, no parent at all. So none of the kids in your orphanage have parents? Okay. Actually, our uh, uh, children, 30% are real orphan, and no father, no mother. But uh, e besides 70%, either uh, they have living uh, father or mother, or the parent abandoned. So this is what happened to them. When Somali mom's story began to unravel, suddenly there was a, a whole heap of attention on what had been largely an open secret that a lot of these kids who were portrayed as orphans weren't actually orphans. Suddenly this, the cat was out of the bag. Surprisingly, most of these children are actually not orphans. Your orphanage donation isn't helping an orphan, it's hurting a child. This problem is not just confined to Cambodia. There are an estimated 8 million children around the world living in institutions like orphanages. What's contributing to this boom? It's us. It's the well-meaning support from people like me who are unwittingly fueling an industry that exploits children and tears families apart. Après le départ des Khmer Rouges, avait bien fait les choses. Ouvriers Fonctionnaires, écoliers, près de 400 000 personnes environ. It was not until the 1990s with the Paris Peace Agreement. There's a lot more injections of Western money. That's when we're starting to see a immediate growth of uh, orphanages throughout the country. The country was stable, it was developing. The parents of these kids were still alive. So why were they ending up in orphanages? And what we began to correlate then was that we, okay, we're seeing an increase in foreign visitors coming to the country as it opened up. And this seems to relate to the increase in orphanages. So we were actually beginning to realize this is a phenomenon. This is orphanage tourism. People are coming, they want to give back to a country that they know has suffered over the last four decades. How do they do that? Oh, wow, well, we can help the children, you know? And where are the children? Oh, they're in orphanages. I think whether you're talking about 20-year-old tourists from Australia or wealthy philanthropists from America, they're all after the same thing, you know, they're all looking to make themselves feel good, I guess. So volunteer from different countries, from Singapore or Taiwan, Malaysia, from America, Australia, New Zealand, they can just volunteer come uh, uh, teaching English. Now, the other side of that coin is local people were saying, right, you know, they're, they're giving money to orphanages, so let's start an orphanage. It seems to be a, a very good business model. The more donations flood in in support of orphanages, the more orphanages opened and the more children were being separated from their families to fill their beds. Between 2005 and 2010, there'd been a 75% increase in the number of orphanages and the number of children living in those orphanages had more than doubled, despite the fact that there was less orphans in Cambodia and the poverty rate was in steady decline. <laughs> Struggling families see them as a better opportunity, that this place could give their kid a better opportunity potentially than they could. Uh, kids can go to these places and supposedly learn English, meet foreigners. You're creating this choice, false choice, of sending your children to an orphanage or staying with the family and a poor family, you know, and, and that's just, nobody should be presented with that option. I think it's almost evil to be, be presenting that option. 
Volunteerism isn't just a buzzword and it isn't just a Cambodian thing, it's a multi-billion dollar global industry. You can make the world a better place. You can free the children all around this planet. I think actually that what we have here is commercialization of volunteering. Organizations who will create the experience for you. It's the way that we work now. We, you know, we look for easy ways. You know, we don't want to put in the, the effort ourselves if we can just click. The placement organizations, you know, they have got very good at what they do. We can do anything from community development work in Nicaragua to wildlife conservation in Costa Rica and El Salvador. They're targeting young people and they're using whatever channels they can to get to them. Internet, of course, Instagram, and they're going into universities. They're really very, very good at, at getting to the kind of people that they know will be an easy target. And I want to make it very, very clear, you know, we're, we are not against volunteering, but encourage it to be responsible. You can help train people in local NGOs, for example, to better use their, their information technology resources, that kind of thing. But that's not so attractive, is it? You know, you can't really get a selfie with the children. I think one of the, the things we have to remember, too, is that, that people generally have good intentions. You know, they, they don't want to cause harm, they actually want to do good. However, People are going into orphanages, playing with kids. They're not thinking about, is it possibly harmful to children rather than beneficial? Thank you, girls. Thank, Thank you. For me, back then, doing that kind of greeting foreigner, it's to become a job. You wake up in the morning, you prepare, you act, you dress up. The director will come to talking to us saying, there will be 20 sponsors come. You need to smile, you need to be very friendly, don't do naughty. These people come in the being nice to us, bring us gift, playing with us, spend time with us like real friends like they sharing even their family picture. And it's a wonderful feeling to get to know them, but also very sad at the same time. Like you are being abandoned over and over again. One day while I was hiding at the school library, Tara came asking me, that I need to tell her the truth, what happened. And I tell her everything. She said, what if I set up a new orphanage? Do you want to come with me? I'm not thinking twice. I just said, I want to go with you. I turned up at the orphanage unannounced with a bus, with the social affairs department and police entourage. The situation is kid running around, a lot of noise, a voice crying. I was shaking. I'm so scared. But I know already that this is my last chance. I need to go now. And later, when we are on the road to the new orphanage, I just say hooray to myself, like, yeah, you did it. I was like, I cannot explain how much I feel overwhelming, scared, but I know that I'm going to be okay. There is no one going to hurt me no more.
When the government went on its big public push to deal with this issue, there was different estimates of how many kids, but between 17,000 I think was the low end and, and up to 50,000, according to some studies, kids were, were in these different various kinds of facilities. Certainly the effort to clean it up, certainly they've put a massive dent in it. I'd say they've got rid of the, the, most, the most egregious one, but it's still available. I mean, you can go online and you can find what, what has been termed now volunteerism. You know, volunteerism is, is still a problem. To be honest, orphanage issues are still a problem. People are still uh, running orphanages uh, very badly. Another thing is the reform saw loads of orphanages shut down and children put back into communities, but the kids were scarred, confused, traumatised, and their mental health was kind of an afterthought. After I leave the bad orphanage, I was so depressed. I always have difficulties making peace to myself, accept who I am. I know they want to help, but what they don't know is that their actions are hurting children. We got a child behavioural therapist to come in and do some training and that's when we first learnt about attachment theory, which basically says that, you know, for children to grow up healthy and well, that the most important things is that they grow up within relationships and at least have a secure attachment with one primary caregiver. When they don't get that, the brain doesn't develop properly. The indiscriminate affection that tourists encounter when they visit an orphanage, when a child runs up to a perfect stranger and jumps into their lap, that is a sign of an attachment disorder. From my experience, children growing up in the orphanage, a lot of them after reintegrate from orphanage, they fell into drug, a robbery, prostitute. One study has shown the young adults raised in institutions are 10 times more likely to fall into sex work than their peers, 40 times more likely to have a criminal record, and 500 times more likely to commit suicide. To me, there is no good orphanage. Even they live at the best orphanage, no one hit them, no one abused them. They get good food, good hygiene. They are not suffering outside their body. It suffer inside and it's going to traumatize them for the rest of their life. The moment that I realized that I want to become an activist for children's rights is when I sat in front of the government people in Australia. Ms. Sinet Chan from the Cambodian Children's Trust. The opportunity has been given to, to further hear about um, orphanage tourism and um, the trafficking of children relating to that. I would like to urge the Australian people to stop supporting, donating or volunteering at the orphanages. Today, I work for the Cambodia Children's Trust, working with young women that just come from the orphanage to live in the society. Those people, they really need help. I think one tricky thing about orphanage kids, they don't know how to ask for help. They are scared and thought that no one understands about them. The more I grow older, I met a lot of young women, Khmer women who have experienced the same to me. 
So my goal to build this care liver network to provide the connection, to provide friendship, sharing life experience from what they have when they were at the orphanage. I am not the one should tell this story alone. There are many more important, unique stories that everyone needs to hear from them. For those kids, I am a big sister who have struggled facing their hard life. And I am still standing today. If I am still doing good with my life, they also can. But first, they need to believe in themselves. The more we sharing our story, sharing our experiment, people going to hear. That is why I keep sharing my story.